What a stunning four-month ride oil prices have been on. Take a look at crude in the aftermarket. Let's start with that. Right now, flat. Prices settled slightly below where we are right now. They settled at $95.78 a barrel. We're at $96.29 a barrel right now. But look at where they were back in February before Russia invaded Ukraine. They then topped $130 a barrel in March, but have since rolled down a bit of a hill. Oil majors... Chevron, for example, under pressure at the moment, down about 1.6 percent. But the stock is up 35 percent over the past year. So much news to discuss. Let's bring in Chevron CEO Mike Worth. Mike, thanks so much for being here. You're welcome, Liz. Okay, from where you sit, what do you think? And from your opinion, what is the number one reason that we have seen oil fall from $130 a barrel in March to where it is now? Well, I think over the prior several months, the concerns about inflation, supply tightness, and the risks created by the conflict in Ukraine uh, created a real uh, anxiety about future supplies, and that drove prices up. In the last few weeks, I think increasingly, we see concerns about a recession and an economic slowdown being uh, much more uh, in the forefront of people's thinking. And I think that would suggest energy demand softens, these markets become more balanced, and I think prices uh, reflect that. So the last 30 days, we've seen prices come down. I think that's good for the economy. It's good for consumers. Uh, I would say, Liz, that there are still risks out there. Uh, we don't have uh, China fully back. There's a lot of China that's under uh, pandemic restrictions. Mm -hmm. Air travel is not fully back, particularly international air travel. So there's some upside in demand. And we still do have a tight supply situation. So I, w I would say the risks skew to the upside, even as we've seen prices. Retrace. How long before we get back to, I don't know, 2018, 2019, where things felt normal when it came to at least a slight balance of supply and demand better than we are now? Demand has moved very quickly and the supply chains are responding to that. We're seeing production grow. We're seeing uh, supplies come into the market, but the demand has moved faster. And so I think we, we really need to see um, some slowdown in the economy to help balance this. And then, of course, the supply response that, that's underway. And as those two uh, begin to come into more of an equilibrium, uh, I think we see prices stabilize. When that happens, it's still a little bit difficult to call. Well, I, I guess I'm not going out on a limb saying that there isn't exact equilibrium between the industry and the Biden administration. Obviously, President Biden has sent in a way some mixed messages. He has slammed you guys saying you are gouging people. You know, those are the words, very, very high profits, but at the same time, record prices. On the other hand, he has asked you to ramp up production. I know that you at Chevron are at records when it comes to production. How much more can you push out there and how quickly? Well, we're growing rapidly. As you say, last year was the highest production in the 143-year history of our company. First quarter of this year, we were up 10% year-on-year in the United States. In the Permian Basin, which is one of the great success stories in this country, our production just a decade ago was a few tens of thousands of barrels to date. Per day now, it's over 700,000 barrels per day. By 2025, we expect to be uh, approaching a million barrels a day. So we're investing, uh, and we're seeing that uh, that growth come. There are real constraints um, in uh, terms of labor. Um, steel prices, availability of drilling rigs. Uh, we face uh, challenges in terms of access uh, to land, uh, regulatory constraints. All of these are things that we're in dialogue with the administration to try to find uh, a policy framework that is uh, stable and that encourages more investment. Uh, this country is blessed with an abundance of natural resources, energy resources, not just oil and gas, but wind, solar, nuclear, hydro, uh, renewable fuels, uh, ethanol, uh, you can just go down the list. Uh, we need a regulatory environment and a policy environment that encourages investment in all of these. Uh, and it's one of the great advantages, I think, that our economy has. And uh, on a consistent uh, investment environment, I think, benefits our economy and uh, in the country. So your response, if not even just President Biden, but maybe some consumers out there, if they were to say, you guys are slow walking production. Your, your bottom line response is? People are not holding back supply. People are not slow walking uh, anything. Uh, they're producing as much in the refining system as is possible. The upstream production is growing. And that's how, that's how a market works. The, the, the price signal, when it reaches this level in a commodity business, and look, we're, we're price takers. Uh, 
we see uh, high prices say consume less, produce more. That's exactly what's underway right now. And I think it's part of the reason why we're seeing prices come down. You and I may understand the feast and famine aspect of your industry. I mean, people don't seem to remember that in April of 2020, the price of oil went negative. Negative. Meaning there were those holding oil who would pay others to get it off their hands. I didn't hear any administrations, uh, you know, screaming at you guys about that when you were really shouldering that problem. But for the diesel truck drivers who have had to go out of business, they don't have a long memory to go back to that point. What do you think the answer is? Is there a way to make a commitment to the consumer as we sit here and talk right now? Well, I think, as I said, the industry is responding with increased production. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to see um, uh, rhetoric and messaging that indicates that uh, our country supports increased production. Uh, we, as I said, we've got tremendous resources in this country. We've got the best industry in the world. The companies in this industry are the strongest and the most diverse. And, uh, and the, the messages, as you said earlier, have been mixed. And it makes investment decisions difficult for boards to invest when uh, what, what they hear is, well, we want you to grow production and invest lots of capital today. But three years from now, five years from now, we don't want that. And so it does present a challenge, I think, in terms of people having the confidence to make the long-term investments that really underpin our economy. One thing that these extraordinarily high prices have done, Mike, and you know this, is opened Americans' eyes and opinions and ideas toward buying electric cars. Have you test driven one? Do you own one? You've driven one? Tell me what you think of electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are great. They're an engineering, I'm an engineer, they're an engineering marvel. Uh, they're beautiful. They're also um, more costly than their equivalents in a, in a you know, traditional internal combustion engine. Those costs have come down. Um, and they have certain performance attributes that are uh, better than an internal combustion engine. Others that, uh, that they're, they're, there may be some trade-offs. and. People buy vehicles to meet their needs, and I think electric vehicles can meet certain consumers' needs. They may not meet every need, but we certainly expect there to be many more electric vehicles in the fleet in the coming years. We, we've prepared for that. All of our planning is based on hundreds of millions of electric vehicles in the global fleet o over the next 20 years, and I think that's part of uh, responding to concerns about climate, a growing global economy, and the advances in all different types of technology. Evolution. Evolution. You know, it's not a political issue as many would like it to be seen as red versus blue, is it not? It's simply we're evolving, are we not? So to that end, how is Chevron evolving to match that? Well, we're leveraging our strengths uh, to deliver lower carbon energy to a growing world. Uh, today, the world needs more oil and gas, as we've been discussing. But it also wants to see a lower carbon energy system in the future. So we're decarbonizing our existing production. We're reducing emissions associated with oil and gas production today. And we're investing in things like renewable fuels, hydrogen, carbon capture and storage uh, to create uh, viable technologies and larger businesses in the future that can contribute to larger demand in the world with lower carbon uh, energy systems. And so we have to be able to do both, uh, but it's what we've done for 143 years. Well, we're below uh, $95 a barrel at the moment. Where do you see oil? I know you probably hate when journalists ask you to predict, but in the next couple of months, where do you predict oil per barrel will be here at West Texas Intermediate? Yeah, it's uh, predicting oil prices fraught with, with risk. <laughs> uh, sometimes I tell people I can tell you what the price will be. I just can't tell you what day it will be that price. <laughs> okay. Uh, but as I say, I think uh, right now recession fears and demand uh, concerns uh, have continued to soften these markets. Uh, but fundamentally on the supply side, things remain tight. And so uh, I think uh, you know, it's likely to continue to be a volatile and unpredictable market uh, for, the, you know, for the foreseeable future. The one constant is volatility, isn't it? Mike, yeah. thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome, Liz.